Does the mic work? Maybe I'll speak loud enough as well. I don't know. Okay, um, very good. <clears throat> so yesterday I um, spent some time in introducing you to this wild multiplet and these super conformal methods to uh, actually construct supergravity theories uh, that can potentially also be coupled to uh, matter, not potentially, but today I will um, uh, do the couplings to matter. And so in, um, so whether you're on shell or off shell, <coughs> even this conformal calculus, as it is called, uh, is useful to construct Lagrangians uh, for matter couplings to supergravity. Uh, and historically, also, this is how it was uh, constructed uh, by a uh, paper by <coughs> De Witt, Lowers, and Van Poyen. So today I want to uh, discuss a bit matter couplings. to n equals 2 supergravity. And you will see here that uh, how this conformal calculus, these conformal methods, actually are used in practice. This is not the only method to construct supergravity theories. There is other frameworks. Uh, uh, here in Italy, there, was a, there is a whole school on um, uh, supergravity, of course, that, that essentially originated by Ferrara and Pietro Frey and Doria and, and company. And so um, these methods are very similar, but not identical. <laughs> At the end of the day, you produce the same kind of uh, results. So I will stick to the conformal approach here, um, because that's well what I learned myself. Uh, and also because the conformal techniques and conformal algebras, of course, are in fact uh, also useful for well, superconformal field theories, etc. So, um, very good. Um, there is two multiplets that I will discuss in um, in this lecture, and this is the uh, n equals two vector multiplet. And such a multiplet, this is an off-shell multiplet, contains, of course, a vector field. And I will introduce a bunch of them, labeled by a capital index I. It contains a complex scalar field, Xi. And then there is, per multiplet, there is three auxiliary fields. I denote them by Y, with a vector notation. And, um, and then there is uh, two uh, per multiplet, uh, basically one Dirac fermion or uh, two Majoranas, if you want. And this is an off-shell multiplet, uh, and it's studied, of course, a lot also in n equals two supersymmetric field theories and Cyborg-Witten theory, where you also learn that the dynamics of these multiplets are governed by a prepotential governed by, and by governed by, I mean, uh, if I want to construct actions, you can write down a holomorphic superspace integral, and that uh, you integrate a holomorphic uh, function, which is called the prepotential. F of x. It's holomorphic in x, it does not depend on x bar. And of course, I'm going to uh, be imposing that this whole theory is going to be superconformal, classically at least. And not all prepotentials allow for superconformal couplings. I'm going to later couple this to the well multiplet. And in order for this to be a, a superconformal theory, that one of the constraints that come out is that this, that this is uh, homogeneous of second degree. Homogeneous of second degree means, in this particular case, that this is equal to, if I take the derivative, this is what I call fi. So fi is the first derivative of, x, of f with respect to x. I contract again with x. I get two times the prepotential. So it's homogeneous of second degree as a consequence of imposing dilatation symmetry. 
So now I'm going to write down uh, the uh, kinetic terms. I'm going to focus mostly on the scalar. You, everybody knows supergravity Lagrangians are long. If you write down all the fermions, I just want to give you all the, uh, well, sort of the, the, the crucial conceptual ingredients in this conformal calculus method. So the scalar, f the, um, I will focus on the scalar fields. I could also do the vector fields, but I chose to do the scalar fields here. So in the scalar field, the scalar sector, we get, um, terms that are look like follows. I will introduce the notation or define the notation in a moment. Sorry. This is essentially the most important or, or the, the kinetic terms or the quadratic terms in this, well, kinetic terms for the scalars. Of course, these are auxiliary fields. They are, are only algebraic. And so what do we have here? We have this Nij is minus I Fij plus I F bar Ij, where this are, these are just the second derivatives of the prepotential. So that's the notation. F is the Prepotential fi is the first derivative, fij the second derivative. This is complex conjugate. <coughs> and so, um, here d mu x are um, covariant derivatives, and here we see the, the coupling to the wild multiplet arising because. When I have to make the theory super conformal, I need to covariantize and, and introduce the gauge fields. And the relevant gauge fields here are the gauge field for dilatation, that's B mu. And then there was a U on R symmetry uh, that in the super conformal approach is, is uh, a local gauge symmetry. And the gauge field is called A mu or curly A mu. Um, and so in this Lagrangian here, in this approach, well, later on we can set, we can gauge fix this B mu to zero. So that is not going to play a role in the action because the special conformal transformations allow to set B mu to zero. So here there is A mu. And notice well, one important fact is to notice that um, the A mu itself will not have a kinetic term. It just appears in these covariant derivatives. And if it has, not a co if it has uh, no kinetic term, I can later eliminate it algebraically using its own equation of motion. I will do that in a moment. These are just the auxiliary fields. And this is, in fact, invariant. Well, if I would also write down the other terms, I will, it will be invariant under the full superconformal algebra. So these are the terms that I want to focus on for the purpose of this lecture. Are there any questions uh, on this? Very good. The second multiplet is going to be the hypermultiplet. And a hypermultiplet has uh, four scalars for each hypermultiplet. And um, here we don't have an off shell formulation for generic hypermultiplets. So one has to, con unless, you, unless they have special properties such that you can dualize them into tensor multiplets, they won't have off shell descriptions. So the construction there will eventually lead to um, on-shell uh, supergravities. So n equals two hypermultiplets. H m is hypermultiplet. Uh, we're going to denote them. Well, yesterday I called them q. Today I will call them phi. And a runs from one to four times n. N equals two supersymmetry requires already whether you couple to supergravity or not. Uh, the number of scales has to be a multiple of four. And if you couple to rigid supersymmetry, you get nonlinear sigma models, and uh, they should be uh, uh, parameterizing or coordinatizing hyperkähler manifolds, whereas in supergravity, quaternion kählers. These are all geometrical structures that are not so important for 
the study of black hole physics because the hypermultiplets will not play that important role. But for the, pre for the purpose of the conformal calculus, it is, is uh, useful to introduce them to see everything uh, at work. So we have Lagrangians for these uh, hypermultiplet fields. Of course, there's also the fermions, but I'm suppressing them. Uh, minus one half, my notation, and we have d mu phi a. I should also call it maybe d mu, d mu phi b. And so this is a nonlinear sigma model with a metric GAB. And um, we have covariant derivatives here. And the covariant derivative here is, let me first write it down and then explain the notation, d mu phi a minus chi a b mu plus one fourth k dot a dot v mu. So let me talk you through this. Um, we have, uh, besides supersymmetry here, that uh, enforces this metric to be of the hyperkähler type, we also want to impose dilatations and um, and also the SU2 uh, symmetries. Now, um, for a metric to have, so for the vector multiplets, the Im imposing the dilatation symmetry forced the prepotential to be homogeneous of second degree. Here there will be a similar constraint, but it's all more ge phrased geometrically. It, it forces GAB to have a homothetic killing vector. That means it's a killing vector that uh, um, is not an iso, so, Sorry, it's not a killing factor in the sense of an isometry, but it should be an isometry up to uh, rescaling. So it's a, it's, a, it's a special type of a conformal killing factor. And that conformal killing factor is uh, denoted by chi A. So this chi A satisfies dA chi B equals delta AB. So if you lower an index with this GAB, you get dA chi B equals the metric GAB. So this is a particular type of a uh, conformal killing vector where uh, it's, already, uh, it's already symmetric in its indices uh, 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 when you take, without writing the DB chi A term. And this means if you take the anti-symmetric part that, in fact, this chi A should be the derivative of some function chi which is called the hyperkähler potential. Not super important uh, for uh, what I want to uh, say about black holes, but if you want to understand this uh, conformal calculus, you'll need to understand a little bit more about the geometry of hyperkähler manifolds with scaling symmetries. Essentially, it means it's a cone. It's a cone, and if you move along the cone, you um, uh, act with the dilatation, so there's a radial variable along the cone, and that radial coordinate is actually uh, uh, can be seen as this as this uh, function chi. This is on shell. This is all on shell hypermultiplets, unless you have also um, um, triholomorphic isometries and stuff like this. You can dualize to tensor multiplet in that case, and then you there is an off shell formulation. You can also think about doing a harmonic superspace uh, um, or projective superspace, and then you can do more than just uh, have off-shell descriptions for, uh, with, uh, uh, or you can re relax the assumption of having isometries. But um, I will suppress all these things for, for today's uh, talk. For black hole physics, all the hypermultiplets do not play a role. I'm going to freeze them to constant values. What I want to do here is just show how that elimination of the um, uh, uh, wild multiplet fields, uh, how that works. So this is the first term. So you see the scale transformations, B mu, uh, need a, they're not, they're not linearly realized in general, so they have a general a, a conformal killing vector, chi A. The second term, arises when you need to impose the SU2 R symmetry. So the R symmetry is SU2 cross U1. The U1 acts on the vector multiplet fields. Here's the U1. And the SU2 acts on the hypermultiplet fields. Now, that SU2 is also not generically a symmetry of the Lagrangian unless this metric has SU2 uh, isometries. 
So you're going to impose that this metric has both scaling properties and SU2 isometries. The killing vectors of this isometry are called, denoted by Ka. I have three of them, SU2. And the gauge field is the gauge field of the wild multiplet. Uh, yesterday I used Ij indices for, uh, well, it's a matter of taste, uh, SU2R uh, um, uh, doublet indices. You can also use the triplet notation. Okay, so this is the covariant derivative, this is the metric. This metric has pro a special property on top of being hyperscalar. It's a cone, and it's a cone with SU2 isometries. That's called a hyperscalar cone, and I can give you a separate lecture on that. Uh, this is where I worked on in the past myself. Very good. So now the superconformal tensor calculus is actually quite uh, um, easy um, in the sense that what you do now is you gauge fix this b mu to zero. Well, that's easy, so just delete it. And you integrate out, you eliminate the a mu field by its own field equation. And similarly, you integrate out the v mu by its own field equation. What happens then uh, is the following. So then we get a mu equals one over two x bar n x f bar i left right derivative this x bar and x is just x bar i and i j and then x so this is an inner product so this is the solution of its own field equation and similarly for v mu it is minus 2 d mu phi a and then something that is called v a. This is a fun uh, well, it's essentially a function of phi. If you go through the equations of motion, you can explicitly write it down. It has a geometrical meaning. It is the sp1 connection that eventually will be present in all quaternionic manifolds because that defines the holonomy group. The explicit expression is not super important here. Well, um, so you see when, when you plug back this a mu into, into these equations, then, uh, well, you have to plug it in here, but it appears quadratically. You see that because of these derivatives, you will get, again, d mu x, d mu x terms. So you basically will get corrections if you group that together with the with the nij terms and the flat derivatives, you will get corrections to this metric here, nij. And that is precisely what a quotient is. What you are doing here is nothing, geometrically, it's nothing else but a quotient, and we're quotienting with respect to the superconformal uh, group. In general, for those who know what quotients are, quotients in physics can be understood as you gauge a certain symmetry without introducing kinetic term for the gauge fields, and then you, they appear algebraically, you integrate them out, and then you, you, you reduce the theory uh, to one of lower dimensions. Uh, and that also uh, arises uh, here. So now I'm going to write down the result of the action after this exercise. It's plugging in, you can all do that, that's just uh, computing. And so the action that we get is, in fact, um, well, it's the determinant of the metric I bring to the. So I only focus on the kinetic terms and not the vector fields kinetic term, but just the. There's also, of course, the the gauge fields of the vector multiplet. I'm, I'm not including them in the discussion here. So it's the kinetic terms from the scalar fields from both hypers and vectors, but also the metric I'm going to write down. And so um, what you get is something like this here. Let me first write it down. Um, So 
So this is a, I'll discuss it term by term. So this is what you get after you've plugged in the, um, <coughs> the value for the gauge field here. This Mij was the old Nij, but there's now correction terms. You can compute these correction terms. The whole thing I denote Mij. This Mij has again a geometrical meaning. It is the metric on a special Kähler manifold. Um, and um, the, the, it differs a bit from the rigid special Kähler geometry, but it's still determined in terms of a prepotential. The second term is the kinetic term for the um, hyper Kähler fields, uh, or the hyper multiplets. <clears throat> and so here we see this hyper Kähler potential and here we see the metric. It's not the old metric, which I denoted by little g. There's correction terms to it, and I put them all together. I call it capital G. And capital G will eventually be the metric on a quaternion Kähler space instead of a hyper Kähler space. <clears throat> then come the more interesting terms, perhaps. <clears throat> So here we see the Ricci scalar appearing. I have not told you exactly where that comes from. Uh, in fact, when you go through the wild multiplet uh, calculus, then uh, at some point you learn that the gauge field for the conformal, uh, special conformal transformations, it's not, a depend it's not an independent field. You can write it in terms of the other uh, fields, the field bind and so on. And when you go through the details, it's precisely that term that generates the Ricci scalar. It generates other terms here, and the to totality of that is captured by these two lines here. Is there no good? Say again? Is there no good? No term? The land of the For sure, there should be a bracket here, but um, I don't hear you very well. A bar? No, very simple. Team bar. Lock, lock. Oh, Alan is lock. Yeah, lock. Yes. Um, um, yes, it's a logarithm. Um, Yes. Capital Yes. It's a little bit more subtle uh, because you see that uh, uh, I still have not reduced the number of fields. This GAB has still the same dimensions, but it will have a couple of zeros. It's a degenerate metric. I cannot invert it. If you cut off these zeros, you remain with a smaller space. That's what happens after you do the, the quotient, essentially. And that one is then a quaternion Kähler metric. So this is special Kähler. For those who know it, it's just a word, but it's the word for the thing that you get. This is how it was discovered, this geometry. It's the word for what you get if you do this conformal approach. Later, this has been understood more mathematically in terms of kähler hodge manifolds and bundles, um, but this is how it was discovered also historically. And then by uh, the Witten van Proen. Uh, and this is a quaternionic metric. Actually, it's called quaternion Kähler, but it's not a Kähler manifold. And so then we get here uh, um, these terms. And here, there's this D field. Remember that yesterday in the wild multiplet, I gave all these fields, and we did some counting. And there were some auxiliary fields. One was called Team Unu, or TAB, an anti-self uh, dual tensor. 
And that tensor is not here on the blackboard. It talks to the, to the gauge fields. It talks to the vectors in the vector multiplet. It's not written on the blackboard here. But D, there was another auxiliary field, a real scalar, D, is actually coupling to the scalar fields. And it only appears, arises linearly. It only arises linearly. And so that's the field that is very easy to eliminate. So if you put here the equation of motion of D, Then you see that x bar i and ij, xj, should be equal to uh, one half chi, the hyperkähler potential. And so, well, what you do then is you take that constraint, you plug it back into the action, and then you see that this term and this term, they become actually equal. Um, uh, and, and this term and this term, they also become equal. Um, and so, but of course the signs are, 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 are such that uh, um, everything works out well. They don't cancel, that would be a disaster. Um, they just combine. And what you then do is also, um, what you see for instance is you get this combination times the, the Ricci scalar curve. And there you see the role of the compensator, not just as a single field, but it's composed of all the fields in the matter multiplets, hyper multiplets, and vector multiplets. They all are multiplying. It's all part of the compensator. So the D equation of motion relates them. And I'm going to now also, of course, um, fix the dilatation gauge and set this to a constant, essentially just one over Newton's constant. This is dilatation gauge. It's one constraint, or one gauge fixing condition. And then you get Einstein-Hilbert. When it's a constant, then these terms luckily also drop, because what to do with this term? Um, they drop out, and you get Einstein-Hilbert coupled to matter multiplets. And that's it. That's it as far as the scalar fields are concerned. Then there's the vector multiple or the, the vector fields. It's a similar story. And the fermions, it's also a similar story. And so uh, this is essentially, so what we then get is we get Poincaré supergravity. Um, and I've eliminated also the, um, um, the, uh, one moment, I've eliminated also the auxiliary fields of the vector multiplets. They uh, only play uh, a more important role if you uh, um, consider gaugings. Um, so I have not written them down here. That was a question. Uh, there you said that the dilatation gauge has to be in the action, right? Uh, but then when you compute the equations of motion, you take variation of that. And how do you know that you don't go out of that gauge? Of course, you have to uh, take care of everything. Um, and um, uh, this has been done properly, of course. And you see another consequence of this. M maybe it's saying the same thing as what you're saying in a different way. If you put this to a constant, you see that you put a constraint on these scalar fields. So you can basically eliminate one of the scalar fields. And if you do the same with the u1, you can eliminate another one. So for instance, what you can do is you can take, let's say, the zeroth component of, uh, not, not the zero component, if you take the zeroth multiplet, x0, you can set x0 to, to 1, for instance. Uh, 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 that's right, yes. Yeah. And um, um, of course, then, your, your manifold of scalar fields become of lower dimensions. That's precisely what a quotient does. Um, and so you have to do that consistently, that, that your gauge choices are admissible, but people have done that, uh, of course. And similarly with, the, uh, with this thing here, the quaternion Kähler manifold that you get here is a four dimension lower than the hyper Kähler one. That's because you can impose a gauge, the SU2 gauge, to eliminate three scalar fields. Uh, and that's precisely uh, reflected in the property that this GAB, although the indices run over the same, it has four, four zero eigenvalues. So you have to gauge fix them away or these, these rows and column away, and what you left over is a manifold of lower dimensions, and, uh, uh, and that all works out consistently. So you get n, n equals 2 Poincaré coupled to 
vector multiplets and hypermultiplets. And these models, uh, they're very important, of course, also in string theory, because they arise in um, Calabio compactifications of um, uh, type 2a and type 2b uh, strings. And uh, the number of vector multiplets and hypermultiplets is determined by the algebraic properties of the Calabio manifold, the Hodge numbers. Um, um, of a Calabio manifold determine are in one-to-one -one correspondence to the number of vector multiplets and the number of hypermultiplets. So in a Calabio threefold, the two independent Hodge numbers are H11 and H12, for those who understand this terminology. And the number of vector multiplets is essentially H11, and the number of hypers is H12, if you're in type 2A, and if you're in type 2B, it's precisely the other way around. That's, of course, uh, important to have that connection because when we study black hole physics using string theory, we want to have the microscopic, uh, microscopic explanation or description. And then you need to know the brains that wrap the cycles and how many multiplets uh, um, are there and, uh, and so on. I, I will not do the microscopics in these lectures. Per perhaps Joao and Samir will say more uh, about this. Very good. Um, perfect. Are there any questions about this? So I'm going to illustrate now this uh, uh, further, or I'm going to discuss a particular example because now I'm done with the matter couplings. Now I want to go back to black hole physics and study black hole solutions in these kind of theories. To do that, I first want to uh, essentially start with a, a, a very particular example um, where there is no hypermultiplets, except the compensator, of course. Uh, but after you've eliminated the compensator, that's gone. So in the Poincaré theory, um, there will be no hypermultiplets, uh, but only vector multiplets. The reason why hypermultiplets are not so important for black hole physics, uh, at least in ungauged uh, theory, is because the hypermultiplets, they are not charged. Uh, and typically, BPS black hole solutions, they are, they are charged, like reisner nernström So what, what gives the, the black hole charge are the, the vectors of the vector multiplet, of course. And so what is going to play a role are the scalar fields in the, in the vector multiplet and the vectors themselves, because they charge the black hole. But the hypermultiplets, they decouple from the theory. There's also no interactions between vectors and hypers. So you can, in any solution, you can take phi to be constant and then this disappears from the equation of motion. Good. So in the example, it's actually one of the first, I think it's the first example where also the notion of the attractor mechanism was explained. Attractor mechanism discovered by Ferrara, Kalosh, Sturminger, Gibbons, there's a few people uh, involved, and so uh, let me discuss this. Um, so example, we take one vector multiplet and zero hypermultiplets. Remember, when you do the conformal calculus, you start with two vector multiplets. One is compensating and one vector becomes a gravity photon. And we start with one hypermultiplet here, but it's eliminated through the calculus. So this is in the Poincaré theory, no hypermultiplets, just one factor. So that means that the bosonic, bosonic fields are g mu nu, a mu zero, a mu one. This is the, the one from the first vector multiplet. This is the second. You can call this a gravity photon if you want, but that's just semantics. And we will have one complex scalar uh, you can call that x0, uh, but usually you take ratios between the x's and uh, a bit of a story. Let me call it just, uh, uh, just z. And then, um, and then I will call this a mu and a mu prime, because I want to follow the notation in, in the book here. And, um, and then the action. Uh, I have to make a choice for a prepotential, f of x equals i or minus i over kappa squared x0, x1. 
And so, um, so again, I start with two vector multiplets, x0 and x1. And out of these two, I construct a, a downstairs after gauge fixing one complex scalar. Um, and so the action for the insiders, uh, I'm cheating a little bit here. Here there's a prepotential, but the action that I'm going to write down now, there is a symplectic rotation such that I'm in a, in a basis in which there is no prepotential. Don't worry, everything is under control, it's well understood, but I'm skipping these important details here. And so I'll write here plus symplectic rotation. And the action, if you work everything out with this conformal calculus, or this example is so simple that, that, that you can even do it without a conformal calculus effect. But, uh, Very good. So what do we have here? Yeah. Um, yes? Is Z the ratio of x0, x1? I wish I could say yes. Uh, no, it's not quite that. You, you have to define these symplectic sections. Uh, and uh, then uh, there, yeah. I'll explain you this in, in, in privately. <laughs> you would like to think so, but that, that has to do with the fact that, that it's not quite that because I've, I've done an electromagnetic dualization uh, and then it's no longer uh, the case and you, yeah. I wanted to suppress this, oh, no, uh, but it's a good question. Um, good, so what do we have here? We have one, we have this special Kähler geometry and it's, uh, well, of course, there's a, there's a sigma model, this Mij from the blackboard, the previous blackboard. Well, it takes, it's just the imagine, one over the imaginary part of Z. And um, here, now I have included the vectors, and here it is. And these vectors, they couple to the scalars. And here are theta angle-like terms, but the theta angle is not constant. It depends also on the uh, scalar field. So these are not total derivative terms. If there would be total derivative terms, then I could have also dropped them, of course, in the equation of motion. And so this, this term is a little bit more difficult. And when we look for black hole solutions, in particular, we're going to look for BPS black hole solutions, we will look for solutions where the real part of Z is going to be zero. And I think, I'm not sure I have to double check, but maybe the experts in the audience can correct me. If you impose BPS on this model here, it will force to set uh, the real part of Z to zero. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think so. Certainly the case for non-rotating ones that, I, that I'm sure about. So I will look for solutions, BPS also, with the real part of Z equals zero, and the imaginary part of Z I will call e to the minus two phi. <clears throat> uh, well, the, 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 there is one thing here. Um, so you see that th this is the uh, metric here uh, on this nonlinear sigma model. I want the kinetic terms to be positive definite, so the imaginary part of Z, well, here's the square anyway, so that's not so much of a problem. But, uh, so I will require this to be, uh, ah, for, for, the, for the kinetic terms of the vectors, this is the answer. Uh, I want here positive definite kinetic term, and that forces the imaginary part of Z to be positive. That's why I write it as E to the something. Good. So now, uh, well, now we can just, I will write down the solution for you. Um, what, 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 
Well, the gauge field will, will be solved and there will be non-trivial. Yeah, I will write down the solution now. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, the, um, so the rest is to be solved from the equations of motion and the BPS conditions. So, one half BPS solutions. Um, is governed by a metric of the form in fact the BPS condition already forces you to put it in this way um, these are isotropic coordinates and so what one finds this is Ferrara, Gibbons, uh, Kalosh, Sturmwinscher is that this is determined in terms of two harmonic functions on R3. This is essentially R3. And e to the minus 2 phi is equal to h1 over h2. And so these can be, harmonic functions can have multiple centers, but I will basically look at the simplest uh, solution where this is e to the minus phi phi zero, phi infinity, plus q, four pi r, and h two is e to the plus phi zero, plus p prime, four pi r. <coughs> so what is here? Here's the asymptotic value of the dilaton. We can see that because uh, when r is infinity, it's just this. And when r is infinity, it's just this. And then we take e to the minus 2 phi is h1 over h2. That becomes e to the minus 2 phi 0. So phi 0 is the asymptotic value of the scalar field at infinity. It's a constant. And it's an arbitrary constant um, that is not determined here by uh, the BPS equations. So uh, P and Q, or Q and P prime are charges. Q is the electric charge that belongs to F, this F here. We have two gauge fields, F and F prime. And P prime is essentially the magnetic charge, not of the gauge field A mu, but of A mu prime. So this is uh, F dual, or F star uh, prime. Uh, sorry, yeah. I didn't write down the explicit expression, but they are essentially similar to what I wrote yesterday, one for f and one for f prime. So this is a solution. Uh, if I would spell out also the form of f there in the book also. <clears throat> and so the point I want to stress here is the uh, simplest example of the attractor equation. Uh, that can be made explicit uh, once we look at the value of the dilaton at the horizon. If we compute the value at the horizon, <coughs> yeah, let me just stress that the horizon is located at r equals zero. <coughs> so you see at, at r equals zero, these harmonic functions kind of, uh, they, they diverge. Um, and so if they diverge here, then this is e to the minus to u, if they diverge, and e to the plus to u, that, that is one of the harmonic functions, this becomes zero here. So that is the, at least in this case, they're non-rotating yeah, non black holes. Um, this is the location of the uh, horizon is at r equals zero. So, um, so at the horizon, uh, then e to the minus two phi, you can compute it from here at the horizon. Uh, you get h1 over h2, so these constants can be ignored. The 4 pi r cancels, and we just get q, uh, q over p prime. I have assumed q and p uh, to be positive. <clears throat> and this is what the attractor mechanism is in the simplest case. We have that asymptotically, the scalar fields, in this case there is only one, they have some, they have some undetermined value. But then there's the radial variable that allows you to go close, uh, close to the black hole or the black hole horizon at r equals zero. At the value or at the location of the horizon, the scalar field that started out being completely arbitrary, it is fixed in terms of the charges of the black hole. 
And in between, there is some attractor flow, it is called. It has a particular profile. There's even a differential equation that you can write down for the attractor flow. I'm not going to do this in these lectures here. Um, but basically, uh, there's a radial equation <coughs> that tells you that whereas you can start with an arbitrary value of the scalar field at infinity, once you get close to the attractor, then they are determined by the charges of the black hole. Um, uh, in this case, Q and P prime. That's sort of consistent also with no hair theorems that says that there is no additional degrees of freedom characterizing the black hole horizon other than the mass and the charge. This mass can be computed, uh, and the mass is given by, at least, well, in the conventions of, of the book, 8mg equals e to the minus phi infinity, well, or phi zero, p prime plus e to the phi zero uh, q. So this is the mass. <clears throat> it's also determined in terms of the charges. But now in the mass, there uh, arises the um, these <clears throat> um, <clears throat> asymptotic values. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so <clears throat> the BPS bound doesn't say, like for Reisner Nurstrom, that the mass should be equal to the charge. The BPS bound says that the mass should be equal to the central charge, the central charge arising in the uh, n equals 2 supersymmetry algebra. Um, and when you compute this central charge here um, for the case at hand, then you will find that uh, this is precisely uh, the central charge uh, in the um, in the SUSY algebra. Yes. Where do the attractor flow equations come from? Well, they're essentially the BPS equations, uh, where you plug in this ansatz for the metric, uh, and you plug in that everything only depends on the radial variable. <clears throat> the BPS equations. Uh, they uh, essentially turn the second order equations of motions into a first order differential equation of motion. All the time dependence is fixed, all the angular dependence is fixed. So it's essentially the equations of motion or the BPS equations reduced to uh, a differential equation in a single variable. Uh, that's what the attractor flow is. It's not a new equation or something. It's, it's the equations that just uh, come out of uh, this ansatz. Other questions? Yeah. Is there a more general solution where you have uh, both electric and magnetic charge for each of F and F prime? Or is it? Um, not in this model. Um, I can double check, uh, but not in this model, no. I think they should be mutually uh, uh, non local. Um, you guys know the answer? Uh, wh wh whether, the, whether the black holes can have both Q and P for a particular gauge field. Uh, so they're, pu they're, they're dionic uh, with respect to a single, because now this is electric and this is magnetic. Um, well, you can do symplectic rotations, and then you start mingling them. But, but there's still the condition that you can always go to a frame in which this is the case. So that's why I'm saying in this model you will not find this. But if you do, again, the symplectic, it's all related maybe again to your first question. If you start doing it, uh, mag electromagnetic dualizations or transformations, then you start to mix F and F prime. And then, uh, but there will always be a, 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 a condition that, uh, or, or a statement that there exists a frame in which uh, this is pure electric. And I, I will double check that, because uh, I'm confused. Um, good. What are the, the so this is a, just a simple example, or a relatively simple example. And um, you see that the harmonic functions, they are playing an important role. Harmonic functions basically characterize both the solution for the scalar fields and for the, um, and for the metric. And also for the gauge fields, you can write it in terms of the harmonic functions, because the electric and magnetic charges are sitting inside um, the harmonic functions. So, um, 
So here we have just one vector multiplet, but we can generalize it to arbitrary number of vector multiplets. So for generic number of vector multiplets, and v. So I will do this. Uh, I will sketch it only here. I'll give the properties. So for generic uh, uh, number of vector multiplets, what we do is we first define these combinations, h lambda, is a definition. So now I have my scalar fields in the vector multiplet, x. Oh, I called it i, I think. I, I should, uh, this, is not, this is not in the book, so I took it from somewhere else. Let me try to be consistent here. h i. These are just definitions. But it wouldn't surprise you that I call them H. They're, if you impose the equations of motion, they're going to be harmonic functions. Uh, and I just had one set. I just had one, an H1 and an H2. Generically, I will have a symplectic pair of H1 and H2. They will be harmonic functions. Um, so HI and HI are harmonic functions. That will include the charges of the black hole. And you see by doing symplectic transformations on the x's and the f's, there sit, you can act with a symplectic matrix on, on this here. You see how you are reshuffling the charges as well. Um, so the metric is, can be written like this here, ds squared equals e to the k. I'll explain it in a moment. Uh, dt plus omega phi d phi squared minus e to the minus k dx dot dx. So what have I written here? This is the space-time metric. Previously, I called it e to the minus u or e to the minus 2u. Now, um, um, now this u. Uh, is written as k, and this k is actually the Kähler potential of this special Kähler uh, metric. So this is the Kähler potential. Kähler manifolds, and particular special Kähler manifolds. Uh, have Kähler potentials. Eventually, you can compute everything from the prepotential. The prepotential determines also the Kähler potential. And then uh, now we can have terms like this here in the generic case. This will also allow for rotating black holes if you have at least multi-centered solutions. If you have a single-centered black hole uh, that is supersymmetric in asymptotically flat space-time, it cannot have rotation. In the multi-centered case, we can have rotating BPS uh, solution. And so um, this omega is determined by, well, an equation that you still have to solve in general. Let me write down the equation. There's a theta part, omega phi, equals h i d r h i minus h uh, i d r h i. That's for the theta. In principle, you have to integrate this. And then we have minus 1 over sine theta d r omega phi. I'm not sure here whether I'm using Russian conventions or not. But the sine, sine theta or cosine theta. The theta uh, h, sorry. And so the field strength, which I written, didn't write down in the previous case, I can now write it down. We have f i r and phi is equal to minus r squared sine theta over 2 d theta h i and f theta phi. Yes, now, now, now you actually see that uh, you, can, you, you can actually have um, the charges. And then there is expressions for the dual field strength.
they are determined by the uh, harmonic functions with lower index i. So this is the sketch of the solution. Uh, of course, it needs to provide a little bit more, a few more details uh, to fully uh, understand all this. So what are the um, uh, main characteristics of the solution? Um, we can have multi-centered solution. I already said that because the harmonic functions can have multiple centers. And once they have multiple centers, then they can also be rotating uh, solutions. So there are spinning multi-centered solutions in four dimensions. Uh, that cannot be spinning four-dimensional black hole solutions. In five dimensions, you can have single-centered rotating BPS solutions, but not in four dimensions. Um, and then the metric is uh, computed from the scalar potential. The scalar potential is determined by the prepotential. The prepotential is basically uh, fixed by axes, and these axes are governed by the H's. You, can, you have to solve this set of equations. Um, to get uh, the prepotential and therefore also the scalar potential, but that's just plugging in and, and computing. So this is specified by harmonic functions. This is specified by harmonic functions, and um, so and this is specified by harmonic functions. So the entire BPS sector of black hole solutions is uh, in fact fixed by harmonic um, uh, functions. The near horizon geometry, uh, I didn't really derive this, but uh, we've, you can easily see that already in the reisner nurstrom case for BPS solutions. Around each center, you will locally find uh, an, uh, the product of ADS2 cross S2 uh, with equal radii. Uh, so this, the size of the S2 and the ADS2 is, is, is equal. I stress this a little bit because in black holes and asymptotically ADS spaces, you also get ADS2 cross S2 uh, near horizon geometry, but with unequal radii. And um, so they all have uh, attractor behavior in the sense that the scalar fields uh, asymptotically are determined by the asymptotic values of the constant parts of the harmonic uh, functions. They are arbitrary, but once you flow to the horizon, then uh, the, um, 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 the scalar fields will, the physical scalar fields uh, will only depend uh, on, the, on the charges. So a model that is very well, that is studied a lot is the, uh, is the STU model. I just mentioned, I'm not going to work out this model, I just mentioned it because it's studied so much. It's based on a prepotential that uh, has the following form. It has three vector multiplets, S, T, and U are the scalars. Uh, so you have to start in the conformal calculus with four vector multiplets, X0 up to X3. Uh, and these models arise naturally from string compactification. And the, the constants here basically are determined in by the triple intersection numbers of the Calabio, and so forth and so on. So this is an example, which is well studied in the literature. Very good. Um, that's all uh, I have for today, but time is up. Uh, maybe there are still uh, a few questions, so thank you.